So, uh, in the previous lectures, we had learnt about uh, water management techniques or not management, but rather harvesting and conservation techniques uh, that were prevalent uh, and existent in ancient India, pre-colonial India. So, today also we will be covering pre-colonial India, but mainly focusing on medieval India that is uh, across the Sultanate and the Mughal uh, regimes. Now, the this whole topic, the theme uh, called water technologies in medieval India. So, I have uh, divided this into two parts. So, in this particular lecture, part one of water technologies in medieval India, I am going to discuss, uh, I am I'm, I'm first I am going to give you a context that uh, how uh, there was a change from you know uh, ancient to the medieval times. So, what was the changing context? So, uh, that would be discussed and uh, then I would be talking about like the various uh, water technologies or rather the various uh, water use and conservation technologies uh, or techniques uh, that uh, the Sultanate and the Mughal uh, rulers implemented uh, across India more importantly in the uh, area of their rule that is North India again specifically Northwest frontier province. So, this would be one. And uh, the second part water technologies in medieval India too, that would be uh, basically focusing on the water lifting devices, the water lifting technologies, because uh, the Islamic rulers, they were extremely renowned for uh, the uh, design and implementation of water uh, lifting devices in India. And uh, this is a knowledge that they not only, you know, um, I mean they not only culminated or nurtured within the Indian context, but uh, we will get to learn that these Islamic technologies were uh, prevalent uh, already in South uh, Central Asia from long back, uh, from where uh, those technologies uh, were transferred uh, to various places where Islam could establish its root. So, these are the two uh, uh, major themes within water technologies in medieval India. So, now let us first concentrate on part 1, where I will be discussing the context and the various water use and harvesting techniques uh, under different rulers of both the Sultanate and the Mughal dynasty. So, uh, as I was mentioning about the uh, changing context. So, uh, I think we should uh, highlight on this particular geographical terrain or geographical location which is northwest frontier province and this is very important because this particular uh, region it is extremely uh, arid and semi arid in nature. So, uh, it is very different from the topography and climatic conditions of the um, Indo Gangetic plain uh, because Indo Gangetic plain uh, crisscrossed by several uh, tropical rivers it is very fertile. But uh, you know, unlike the Indo-Gangetic plain, Northwest Frontier Province is a desert region, uh, and which had uh, very less agricultural productivity. Now, uh, one of the major contributions of Islamic rule in India was that uh, during the Islamic rule, Northwest Frontier Province was transformed from an arid region to a region where there was, I mean, where land was brought under the plough. So, uh, there was cultivation and number of crops, numerous crops, so we will get to learn about that gradually, numerous crops and vegetables and fruits were cultivated in this particular area through the use of extensive and elaborate water management techniques by the Islamic rulers. And uh, even Irfan Habib, who is a very renowned uh, historian uh, on uh, medieval India, especially who focused on uh, the Mughal rule, uh, the Mughal India, and he also, you know, he is an economic historian. So he came up with the argument that uh, uh, during this time, during the uh, Mughal time and also the pre-Mughal time, uh, there was an agricultural revolution in India. So we will not enter into the debate that whether India um, had an uh, agricultural revolution during this time or not, but this is for sure we can definitely accept this particular argument that India and more specifically Northwest frontier province it uh, saw it visualized a lot of uh, agricultural you know productivity and agricultural prosperity that uh, through which the farmers also could make their fortunes. So, uh, yes Tapon Rai Chaudhary and Irfan Habib in their uh, edited volume on the Cambridge economic history of India a seminal and path uh, breaking volume. Uh, which was published in uh, 1982. So, there uh, Chaudhuri and Habib uh, writes mentions this set him, now who is this him? Him is the Indian farmer. So, this set him apart from the peasants of a large portion of the globe. 
So they say that the you know uh, there's there's a there's a difference between uh, peasants or farmers of India and peasants of rest of the world. Why? Because peasants of a large portion of the world, their knowledge was confined to a very few crops, and uh, compared to that, Indian peasants they had the you know they had the flexibility to grow numerous crops. And here comes the role of the water techniques, the uh, water practices that were prevalent or that were implemented under both the Sultan, uh, Sultanate and the Mughal rule. So, and what was the result? The result was, uh, you know, uh, new crops, not only, you know, old crops uh, uh, were practiced or, or, or were cultivated in the Northwest Frontier Province, but new crops uh, were also introduced. And these new crops uh, included sugar, rice, cotton, and wheat. And we all know that these crops like sugar, rice, cotton, wheat, it actually require, uh, required a lot of water. So, more water, lot of water was required. So, then we will come to know that how in this particular arid region, they could really uh, you know uh, manage to grow uh, crops like sugar, rice, cotton and wheat that are water intensive. So, as you can understand that pre-Islamic methods, they seem to be extremely inadequate to meet the new agrarian productivity, the new agrarian needs. And uh, so, development and diffusion of water technologies, uh, we definitely, uh, you know, this Islamic period or Miravan India, it is uh, loaded with, thickly loaded with the history of development and also diffusion. Diffusion means spread. So, spread of water technologies to raise or to lift water from, uh, you know, from, from, uh, from the ground, from the depth uh, and also store and distribute water. So, as we are discussing or focusing on Northwest Frontier Province, which is otherwise a desert, so it is very important to, you know, uh, to, to uh, lift water from the uh, subterraneous uh, uh, portion of the soil. So, uh, so how did they uh, tackle that? So, how did they came up with the lifting devices? How could they raise, lift, store and distribute water? So, this is the story of lifting storing and distributing water in the northwest frontier province leading to an agricultural revolution, if not agricultural revolution, but at least increase in agricultural uh, productivity that set apart the Indian farmer from the peasants or farmers of the rest of the world. Yeah. So, uh, now coming to the Sultanate rule. So, Iltutmish is a person, it is very interesting that when we actually study our conventional uh, history textbook, uh, our conventional history textbook never mention about uh, the very other interesting aspects of Sultanate rule for that matter or Mughal rule. So, but nowadays, you know, there are a group of historians that had already talked about who are focusing on environmental history. So, if you, uh, you know, go through their accounts, you will find that, uh, you know, you will find the environmental history uh, during the different dynasties or during the uh, different regimes uh, or rule uh, that happened in India. So, the environmental historians, uh, they um, offer us uh, with information that Iltutmish was one of the first uh, uh, rulers who could construct very big large scale water reservoirs. She was the first Delhi uh, uh, Sultan who uh, constructed water reservoirs and uh, during his rule, during his uh, uh, reign, this particular lake, the large lake called Haus e Shamsi, which was almost like 2 miles uh, in length and 1 mile breadth. So, such a big lake, such a large lake was constructed. Um, uh, under, uh, I mean, during his rule, and uh, this, these reservoirs and lakes were responsible for both uh, uh, the purpose of meeting the drinking water needs of Delhi, and uh, also the irrigation needs, uh, irrigation for uh, agri uh, agriculture, and uh, these were also uh, these also served the purpose of uh, rainwater storage or rainwater harvesting. So, bo all, all these three like drinking water, irrigation and rainwater storage. And one interesting question is like uh, from where do we get to know about uh, these details? Like this particular, these facts that uh, you know under uh, Iltutmish, these reservoirs were constructed, the large lakes were, l l large lakes came up and they made the drinking water irrigation and uh, rainwater storage needs. 
uh, during that particular point of time. So, from where do we get this kind of information? This kind of information is available from, from the Persian sources from which are known as Persian chronicles from the Urdu sources and they had uh, you know they, 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 they uh, provided patronage to many court poets, many you know court patrons like Amir Khusru, Isami and all. So, if you uh, go through these accounts, if you go through these uh, chronicles and uh, sources and evidences, you will get to know about this history. So, these sources also mention that the, this particular uh, lake uh, Hajj e Samsi, uh, it was again uh, re excavated by uh, Alauddin Khilji. So, it was very important uh, for uh, the water needs of Delhi and the adjoining areas. So, uh, that is why it, was, it became Im, uh, important and imminent for Alauddin Khilji to uh, uh, re maintain and re excavate uh, this particular lake and the reservoir. So, apart from that, so, apart from maintaining Haz e Shamsi that was built under uh, that uh, came up under Il Tutmish, Alauddin Khilji also uh, under his uh, uh, I mean uh, under his reign uh, this particular uh, reservoir a very famous one called Haz e Khas also known as Haz e Alai. So, this uh, uh, was constructed. So, it is a large square tank with 600 meter length and 70 acres breadth. So, it is a very uh, huge lake which is still uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, remembered in uh, Delhi because we will uh, see a picture where we will see how you know uh, surrounding this particular uh, tank an entire complex uh, came up and the complex is still there though the uh, tank I mean the tank that we uh, have today it is very different from you know uh, the tank that was built during the time of Alauddin Khilji. So, but uh, Haujikas is still very much prominent and present in uh, both the uh, you know uh, the, in both the cognitive memory and also the physical space of Delhi. So, Ali Yazdi again uh, another uh, uh, another uh, scholar uh, on uh, during the Islamic time. So, he uh, wrote a wrote a uh, wrote an account of the um, Sultanate uh, rule and uh, this account is called Zafar Nama. So, Zafar Nama mentions that Daryacha or small sea that was filled up with water during the rainy season and served the need of water supply to the people of Delhi for the whole year. So, he mentions Haz e Kas as a small sea. So, you can understand how much water it contains. So, it was large because we already know 600 meter length and 70 acres breadth. So, uh, it uh, is almost Daryacha or small sea. So, as I was mentioning this is the uh, famous uh, Haz e Khas uh, um, complex. So, here there is this is the uh, tank and uh, you know uh, the large complex surrounding this entire area. So, these areas are inhabited by people and this is an interesting relic. Uh, uh, our, and the stone that mentions uh, or provides information about Haz Khas that, uh, uh, that Alauddin Khilji excavated this uh, large tank and it also provides the information that it was, uh, it was uh, I mean after Alauddin Khilji it was also mentioned, uh, it was also maintained and uh, re-excavated by Firusha Tugla. So, there is a long history about uh, Hazi Khas that you find uh, in this particular inscription. Now, uh, coming to Muhammad bin Tughlaq, it is uh, very interesting, but uh, before going to Muhammad bin Tughlaq, there is a little bit of coverage on uh, Ghiyasuddin Tughlaq. And uh, Ghiyasuddin Tughlaq, uh, uh, we know from our again from our school uh, history textbooks that uh, Ghiyasuddin Tughlaq, he found uh, this particular uh, city called uh, Tughlaqabad, right. And so, Tughlaqabad it was very important. So, when uh, one particular uh, city is designed, the first important thing uh, that is uh, you know important uh, to be planned for uh, so far as city planning is concerned, which is known uh, as water in water out. That is from where would the city get its water supply and then where the city would actually channelize its waste water. 
So, this is known as water in water out technology. So, when a particular uh, planner plans a city, the most important thing that need to be taken into consideration is this water in water out process. So, the same thing also uh, you know uh, uh, Gyasuddin Tughlaq uh, knew uh, this particular thing and he knew this particular thing is uh, validated uh, by the fact that when he planned Tughlaqabad, he also uh, planned the construction of uh, tanks. Uh, for storing rainwater, he planned the construction of numerous wells so that uh, to ensure uh, water supply in this new city of the Tughlaqabad. And uh, from archaeological uh, 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 archaeological excavations, uh, we find that uh, six of these uh, numerous wells uh, had been unearthed. And so this is something from uh, Futu us Salatin, uh, I think by Izami. So, Futu Salatin, a very important source again, it mentions that the suggest, uh, sagacious king ordered the digging of a tank under the elevated fort. So, every moment the tank was beset by waves like the seven oceans beneath the Caucasus mountains. So, it seems that he is comparing you know uh, the, the beauty and the extent of the tank with uh, other regions and uh, so the beauty is captured in his uh, poetic lyric where he mentions that beset by waves like seven oceans beneath the Caucasus mountains, a very interesting poetic manifestation and reflection of what he could observe uh, from this uh, tank. Uh, and then uh, after Ghiyasidun uh, Tughlaq, uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq's reign started and uh, it is very unfortunate that uh, we uh, only if we uh, if I ask anyone that uh, do they remember Muhammad bin Tughlaq or not, uh, they will say yes and they will say that he was the mad king. Uh, of India, because that is uh, how he is portrayed in again conventional history textbooks. So, he is uh, categorized as or he is stigmatized rather as the mad king of uh, India, but this is a uh, very linear and uh, partial uh, history, this is not true, because lot of interesting things, a uh, lot of interesting activities happened during the reign of uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq and one should also know that you know uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq was highly criticized for transferring his capital from Delhi to Daulatabad. Okay. Uh, but uh, one reason that why he had to uh, transfer uh, the population or his capital from Delhi to Daulatabad is that during that time uh, you know that region of India was encountering was suffering from a great famine. So, it became very important for Muhammad bin Tughlaq to think about how you know this famine uh, could be uh, uh, tackled, okay, addressed. So, we see that from the various accounts we get to know if we uh, I mean only go through the accounts of imperial historians like Stanley Lane Pool and all, then Muhammad bin Tughlaq is only you know uh, identified as a mad king. But if we look into the other sources, the Parsian chronicles. For example, Muhammad bin uh, Tughlaq's biography has been written by one of his sisters. So, if we go through those uh, sources, we will find that Muhammad bin Tughlaq, he really was very serious to uh, I mean to come up with steps, effective measures that can really control the famine. So, what he did is that he advanced loans, he advanced loans to peasants for digging wells and buns. So, this is what Muhammad bin Tughlaq did, uh, though all his experiments were not very successful, but it is found from these uh, records or sources that uh, he was quite sympathetic to the peasants uh, and he tried to help them uh, to fight the, uh, fight the famine uh, by providing loans to them. And the few loans were actually provided with uh, the only purpose of uh, digging wells and creating buns for uh, managing water, storing water. Yeah, Firuza Tughlaq, so who uh, came to power after Muhammad bin Tughlaq, so he had lot of challenges in front of him because uh, Muhammad, bin tu, uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq's reign, uh, it created uh, some uh, problems, few crises. Uh, uh, for the empire and so when Firusha Tughlaq uh, he came to power, uh, he had lot of challenges in front of him and he is very famous uh, uh, I mean so far as water uh, conservation and water use techniques are concerned because during Firusha Tughlaq's reign numerous uh, water reservoirs, lakes, aqueducts, irrigation channels were constructed 
and uh, so so he is uh, credited with uh, coming up of the biggest network of canal so uh, and uh, there are various sources uh, the most important being tariki firuz shahi so tariki firuz shahi mentions that firuz shah created biggest network of canals so we uh, these two canals were very famous so one uh, this uh, rajabwa canal bringing water from the uh, yamuna and the ulukhani canal uh, bringing water from the satlej so these two uh, canals rajabwa and ulukhani it ensured water supply in hisar firuza so hisar firuza was a new town uh, or the city again which was uh, constructed by under firuz shah tughlaq so it's uh, i mean uh, during the uh, sultanate uh, regime we also have very interesting uh, uh, history of the uh, emergence of new cities like tughlaq abad uh, like uh, firuzabad like uh, hisar firuza and all that so uh, the firuzabad canal was uh, the big canal it was also uh, excavated in uh, 1335 and uh, this gets mentioned in the uh, report of uh, major uh, colvin so major uh, colvin uh, uh, he looked into the history of canals uh, both small canals and large canals uh, in delhi and uh, so his uh, one of his papers also got published in the journal of asiatic society so from uh, so i have taken this reference from there so colvin mentions about the firuzabad uh, canal and he says that the canal was extremely important in the area uh, where well 130 feet deep and the springs often are salt so where wells are 130 feet deep and the springs uh, they are often salt so you know remembering uh, these challenges Uh, it should be kept in mind that the Firuzha Canal really had to play a major role for ensuring water supply uh, for this particular region. So, apart from canals, uh, Firuzha's reign is also credited with the construction of large tanks, and these are some of the famous uh, large tanks which were constructed uh, under his rule. Uh, one is Haudi Tughlaq Shah, Haudi uh, Kutluk Khan, Haudi Shah Zada Fath Khan. so these are few of the large tanks uh, that were constructed and there is another interesting information that we get that is uh, the dams on the dams sluice gates were constructed and this is very important because uh, this is the first time that we uh, you know the, this is the first time that we find the mention of sluice gates and why sluice gates were uh, there uh, in these dams because it was very important to control saline water so sluice gates were uh, constructed with a specific intention or function of controlling uh, saline water in the dams so this is also very important uh, uh, because uh, firuz shah uh, tughlaq's reign for the first time it introduced the uh, use of sluice gates in the bands and the dams so the picture of the canals and he said yeah so now uh, i'll come to the mughal rule so uh, mughal rule uh, is also uh, credited with the um, the with with well irrigation uh, numerous wells uh, had been unearthed numerous wells were excavated under the different uh, prominent mughal rulers and uh, again as i mentioned that we have this persian chronicles we have the urdu sources we have the uh, the the like uh, books and uh, the accounts by the court poets and also the foreign travelers we also have some epigraphic sources that talk about uh, the uh, wells and uh, water reservoirs bands and bandaras so aini akbari the famous uh, account by abul fazal who was uh, akbar's uh, court poet so uh, abul fazal mentions in aini akbari that most of the province of lahore which is today in pakistan is cultivated with the help of well irrigation also one important point to keep in mind here is that uh, they uh, implemented uh, well irrigation or water reservoir uh, in 
specific areas according to the specificities of those geographical locations. So, for example, the topography and the climate and other geomorphological features uh, of Lahore uh, prompted them uh, to uh, devise well irrigation mechanism or to design and develop well irrigation mechanism over there, which might be different from other areas where we find the prominence of tanks, which might be again different from other areas where we find the prominence of bans and bandaras. So, these you know mapping the specificities, mapping the specific context uh, was very uh, important for both the Sultanate and the Mughal rulers and first they used to uh, understand the, uh, the, the, the physical features of a particular region and then they used to come up with uh, you know uh, plans or techniques uh, which are extremely tuned to those particular regions. So, for example, uh, for so far as Lahore was concerned, so they had the idea they could understand from Lahore's uh, typical topography or specific topography that for Lahore wells were the most important, I mean wells could be the most important um, water technology that should be uh, that should be you know uh, spread across the lengths and breadths of Lahore. So, again, so as I mentioned, so Lahore we find well irrigation, on the other hand, in peninsular India we find irrigation tanks. Similarly, we find bunds in uh, the various regions of North India, so, thousands of canals were cut, thousands of canals were cut from river which used to serve the towns and villages. And so, uh, these canals were used again for the purpose of both drinking water and um, agri uh, agriculture irrigation, more importantly irrigation. And uh, we also have a rich history of uh, large canal excavation and very importantly these canals were not only excavated, but they were also very much maintained and repaired. Okay. So, we have uh, the history of uh, maintenance, re-excavation and repair of these uh, particular canals. And uh, for example, Rajabwa that we uh, already mentioned. So, Rajabwa used to uh, bring water from the Yamuna river and it was excavated during the time of, of Firusha Tugla. So, it was re-excavated by Akbar. It was also uh, uh, maintained and re-maintained by uh, one of the provincial officials uh, who is uh, Shihabuddin Khan. And so, the name of the canal Rajabwa it became uh, Shihab Nahar because uh, Shihabuddin Khan he invested funds for the re excavation of the canal. Again, this canal was uh, re excavated uh, as I mentioned during the time of Akbar, and uh, so, so it became uh, Shaikhuni. Shaikhuni is very interesting because uh, Akbar used to call uh, his son uh, Jahangir as uh, Shaikhu Baba. So, on his name, uh, this canal was uh, renamed. So, another important administrative post that we find during this time is Mir E Ab. So, Mir E Ab means the canal su uh, superintendent. Interestingly, this legacy continued during the British uh, period as well, because in uh, during the British period also we have the uh, post of this canal superintendent. Uh, uh, and uh, so, the post of canal superintendent was also uh, very much prominent and who was called Mir E Ab during the Mughal rule. Yeah. So, uh, now uh, coming to Shah Jahan's rule. Uh, uh, so, uh, during Shah Jahan's uh, time, this particular canal called Nahir e Birhisht or Nahir e Faiz. So, this is one of the uh, prominent canals uh, which was excavated during the time of uh, Shah Jahan Abad. There is a very interesting book, uh, you know, a Persian. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, on the on the maps uh, the, uh, of the uh, I mean, on the maps that captures uh, different uh, uh, different aspects. Uh, it also focuses on the canal. If we uh, see this particular book by Susan Gol, uh, we will find out the different panels and alignments of this uh, particular canal. And uh, this canal was so important that I talked about Colvin and his research or or his account on the canals um, uh, 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 in Delhi. So, Colvin says that uh, it entered the city and passed uh, pass through uh, by an open channel, it travels another extensive aqueduct into the palace, so palace uh, specifically the fort. So, and um, so these are some, some more details about this particular canal. Uh, so, um, there is another very interesting research done by Abha Khan specifically focusing on the irrigation uh, of Haryana. So, this uh, it is a chapter. 
published in the edited volume uh, by Irfan Habib on the agrarian history of Mughal India. And there Abha Khan writes that undoubtedly this canal, so Shah Jahan's western Yamuna canal was a considerable feat of engineering. It, this is very important. So, his, we are talking about the Mughal ruler, uh, rulers or the, we are talking about Mughal rule and uh, Abha Khan is saying that it was a considerable feat of engineering for which its builder have yet to receive due credit. We will explain this when we come to the next lecture. So, coming to the uh, final part of this uh, lecture presentation. Uh, so, apart from large canals, uh, small canals were uh, also excavated. For example, if you find a number of small canals in the upper Bari Doab uh, region. So, Punjab, uh, the famous Shahnar uh, uh, over there, other small canals cut from the Tapi, uh, Tapi to Tavi to irrigate Ali Mardan's garden, again, one provincial, uh, uh, provincial officer at Sodra near Wazirabad. Multan, it was also uh, crisscrossed by canals, and uh, during the time of uh, Aurangzeb, several accounts mention uh, about uh, the inundation and inundation canals and uh, well irrigation. Uh, so these were prominent features during uh, the uh, during the rule of Aurangzeb. And waterworks, as I mentioned earlier, it was also very much carried out not only by the Mughal rulers but also by their provincial ministers. So, very few examples here, two examples. So, like between 16, 20 and 29, Mir Abra's canal was excavated. Uh, so, Mir Abra was a provincial minister who excavated the canal in North Sindh. And Darya Khan, he also, um, he also tried to uh, uh, store, uh, I mean tried to come up with devices in the Deltaic region. So, we get the name of another provincial uh, minister Darya Khan for the Delta. Apart from that, uh, Hardiman he has done some research on the uh, on the uh, Bandharas uh, or small scale uh, small scale dams or Bandharas in the Shahiyadri region that is the Western Ghats. So he also talks in detail about the numerous you know small uh, Bandharas uh, that were uh, there in this region and uh, how effective uh, their role was in terms of uh, water storage. So, finally, uh, so what was the outcome of this extensive, you know, water, uh, I mean, uh, 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 what was the outcome of the use of uh, these water technologies or what was the outcome of this elaborate and extensive water techniques that were used, uh, especially in uh, North India, more specifically Northwest Frontier Province. The outcome was, of course, agricultural productivity and not only increase in agricultural productivity, but also we get varieties of crops. So, the outcome was multiplicity of crops, this multiplicity is very important, this is very important to understand that today unfortunately, we are going you know moving forward towards monoculture, but during that time you know they focused on multiplicity of crops, which is which is very good you know for the health of the soil, for the health of people and also for the health of the treasury. So, Aini Akbari. It, uh, it's, it gives detailed economic account or it also talks about the revenue rates. So, for 16 crops of Rabi and 25 crops of Kharif in Agra alone. So, these were the varieties of you know uh, crops which were cultivated during that time. So, it also mentioned about, uh, mentioned about the you know uh, the cultivation of 41 crops in a single year. So, let us uh, you know take this very seriously that uh, during that time 41 crops were cultivated in one within one uh, year per annum. And uh, during the 17th century two uh, major crops were introduced tobacco and maize and citrus foods fruits like sugar cane grapes pomegranates and other citrus foods were also grown. And not only the quantity of crops fruits and vegetables, but we get to know from the uh, foreign uh, travelers, from, I mean from the accounts of foreign travelers like Ja Baptiste Travania and also Ja de Theveno that the crops and fruits were of very good quality. They also talk about one particular rice variety which is called the Kamod, K A M O D. So, this is a particular rice variety. So, and they say that the taste of this particular rice variety was delicious. So, these are the facts that we get to know which uh, help us understand that how 
uh, water management techniques or how water technologies transform the north or the entire northwest frontier province uh, into a very um, you know into a, into a region that could really bear or that could uh, grow uh, multiple crops uh, within a season or uh, you know um, in uh, two seasons uh, or three seasons in a year. So, this is the references uh, for this lecture. So, as I talked about uh, the research of Major Colvin on the canals in Delhi, uh, talked about uh, Hardiman's uh, work on the small dam in the Western Ghats, and of course, Tapun Rajodhir and Infan Habib uh, edited volume on the Cambridge Economic History of India and other books uh, as well, and Abha Singh irrigating Haryana. So, these are the few, uh, some of the few references. Uh, that you need to consult to get more detailed information on what had been discussed uh, in this particular lecture. Thank you.